Francis. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Nice to see the room filling up. Welcome, everybody. Okay, and Hala, over to you. Okay, thank you. So welcome everyone to another webinar of conversations on COVID-19 series. I am Hala Ali, the coordinator of Easter Alliance for Global Health Partnerships. These webinars take place on Fridays at 12 p.m. GMT, 1 p.m. Irish time. And every week we host experts from healthcare and global health fields to discuss various aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this webinar is the 10th in the series, and we are taking this chance to acknowledge and support our amazing healthcare workers in the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic in, from every corner in the world. So the topic today is protecting healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's our pleasure to co-organize this webinar with the Society of Occupational Medicine. The Society of Occupational Medicine is a registered charity in the UK with a mission to improve uh, the health of uh, the working age population across the UK and globally. It published the journal, the journal of uh, Occupational Medicine, and additionally, SOM is a national leader uh, in providing continued professional development, such as webinars in occupational health, and also hosts academic and uh, musculoskeletal uh, health at work forums for exchange of ideas, resources, and best practice. The membership is open to anyone with an interest in the work, uh, workplace health. So the recording of this webinar will be uh, available on our website and also on YouTube channels shown on the screen. Live streaming is also available right now on our YouTube channel, Irish Global Health Network. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the question and answer feature in the bottom of the screen. And for now, I will leave you with my co-host, Nadine ferris Franz, the Executive Director of Irish Global Health Network. Nadine? Thank you, Hala. So welcome, everybody, to our, as I said, the 10th webinar. Um, it's amazing how quickly uh, the week comes around and how many suddenly we've, we've had 10 webinars. And today, as Hala said, we're particularly excited to uh, be co-hosting this um, with the Society of Occupational Medicine um, and also to be focusing on healthcare workers, really something, you know, something that we're very privileged to be able to do. So excited to, um, to have speakers, amazing speakers with us today. We have Dr. Ivan Ivanov, uh, your so welcome Ivan, team leader for the Global Occupational and Workplace Health Team in WHO Geneva and he's also serving as part of the COVID response team with WHO's uh, Global Emergency Program. So we're grateful you could take some time out to join us today Ivan. Uh, we have Dr. Will Ponsoby, who is the president of the Society of Occupational Medicine. He's a senior lecturer in occupational medicine in the MSc on Occupational Medicine at the University of Manchester. Delighted to have Will with us today. We have Professor Pierluigi Coco. Um, he is in Italy. He's a professor of occupational medicine at the University of Calgary with a long-standing collaboration. I hope I said that even slightly oh, right. <laughs> I need to work on my Italian <laughs> Sure. It's too difficult for you. Okay. <laughs> Pagliari. Maybe that's better. Um, and the, the university has a long-standing collaboration with the Occupational and Environmental Epidemiological Branch of the U.S. National Cancer, Cancer Institute. Uh, delighted to be welcoming Joy Mugambi. She is sitting in Kenya today. She's a general practitioner in Nairobi. She has done a lot of work with WHO on occupational health of health workers. And she's also the Secretary General of the World Health Organization for Family Physicians in the Africa region. So welcome to Ireland, Joy. Um, and lastly, uh, not leastly, um, we have, of course, our webinar anchor, Professor Rory Brewer, who's the former head of epidemiology and public health in the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Um, today, towards the end of the webinar, we're also going to show just a very, very short clip from a new, uh, a new video series that's been launched this week between the Gori in Wexford and the, the Gori GP practice and Malawi, um, a, a really interesting video for, for healthcare workers. So, Rory, if I can hand over to you, if you could just kick us off. Um, we'd love to hear just the state of play as, as, as always. Thank you. Okay, not sure if this is going to come in. Uh... You can just let me know. So just I'll speak through it in the hope that uh, the screen will, the share screen will come up. Is it coming up? Yes, that's good. Great. So let's just try and get into, uh, into slideshow. So the first half, um, 
uh, of this just short introduction is going to just look at a global overview uh, of the pandemic uh, and then some transition slides into some slides on uh, impacts on health workers. Fortunately, we'll have much better inputs uh, from the panel. So um, these next three slides are from the Worldometer. As you know, I, I, I'm a fan of it. Here's, um, and what I've done here is I've just pulled out uh, what I think is most useful in the Worldometer. So most, most of these dashboards show total cases uh, and total deaths. Uh, it provides three other useful indicators, which is cases per million population, deaths per million population, and tests per million population. Uh, the problem with um, any, any dashboard like this is um, the, the, if a country isn't testing, uh, then we don't really have uh, an, any great insights. Uh, and usually there's a lot of underreporting that goes on. So we have what over uh, almost five, uh, five million cases uh, there, uh, 334,000 deaths. And as we know, the US is um, way ahead in terms of cases uh, and, and, and way ahead also in terms of deaths. It's, um, it's testing is improving, uh, its level of testing, and Russia's level of testing has improved a lot. So we're not quite sure what's happening because they're reporting a, a, an inconceivably low number of deaths per million population. And Brazil, as you know, following in the media lately, uh, is, is rapidly, it's on its way to second in the world in terms of uh, the, the impact of its pandemic. So I've just kept in, on the left there are the, the, the numbers of cases, uh, that's how the countries are ranked. I actually left Italy out, Italy is quite similar to Spain, and I kept in UK, um, Germany and, uh, and China. Um, so the, the, the most notable uh, thing here is uh, as we will see, the countries that are performing really badly, as we discussed last week, are ones where there's very poor leadership. Of those countries there, Germany is probably performing the best, but China had a remarkably successful virtual suppression, even to the point that maybe it has underreported its debts. But it's, the, it's the, the second and third slides now, if I can get into them, that are, are more interesting. And the first thing I would point out, you've got Sweden at the top there, and Norway at the bottom, two Scandinavian countries. And I'm gonna say a little bit more about Sweden later. But what stands out there is that um, Sweden is the one country, as many of you will know, that have gone for this um, herd immunity approach and a very light sort of uh, distancing, uh, no mandatory closures. And they've had twice as many cases as Norway and similarly for uh, um, uh, Denmark and, and Finland, uh, they tested half the number uh, of people uh, per uh, 1 million population, but their deaths are almost 10 times as high as in Norway and is similar in, in Denmark um, and Finland. And I'll say a bit more about that later. But in here, we have some of the, the really good performers um, internationally, uh, Singapore uh, and South Korea. And really the marker of success is your death rate and your death per million population. Um, and in the, in the case of some of these, like Korea hasn't done a lot of testing. And I think we really do need to keep going back to Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China to see what did they do right? Because we can continue to learn lessons from them. Ireland is doing uh, really ramping up the testing, but we're not great on deaths per population. And now we see South Africa coming in there. The good, the, the well-performing countries in Europe are Portugal, uh, Czechia, uh, Czech Republic, and then when we see here, uh, Greece, uh, I Iceland, Slovakia. They're the sort of smaller countries of Central Europe, um, Southern Europe. Uh, we know Australia, uh, well, we know New Zealand because we're so impressed by our prime minister. But actually, if you look at the indicators for Australia, they're very, very similar to, to New Zealand. And perhaps it's easier to isolate yourself when you're down in the Antipodes. But again, look at these death rates, incredibly low in Hong Kong and Taiwan, which is where we need to be uh, looking for our lessons. So what, what do we learn from, uh, and this is, uh, this is a very sort of a crude categorization. We've got the early controllers in Asia, very quick, decisive responses, and they learn from SARS and MERS. That's what a lot of the literature says. 
Um, variable in terms of tracing, but really in terms of testing, but really good on tracing and tracking cases. Um, and it's, I'm going to mention that in, 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 in a minute. One, one of the controversial areas we have to look at is how do we balance the population interest, the public health versus the, uh, the, the, the importance of privacy and GDPR that we put in, in uh, I, I, on, on privacy in Europe, because that, it, the tracking of the cases is really, is the difference. We've got the early controllers I mentioned already in the West, quick and decisive responses, quiet leadership, usually high levels of testing. And then we've got the slow, uh, slow, the late controllers in Europe, the ones that were really caught unawares. I mean, we were, we were able to learn from the misfortune of Italy. In a way, Italy, you could say, should have the less sort of blame attached to it because it was the first in Europe. Spain, okay, followed very closely on Italy and so did France. UK eventually has joined the late controllers and has left this group, the failed responders, the anti-scientific leadership characterized by denial, blaming others, blame China, and the latest thing the Republicans do in the US is they blame the dead. They blame those Americans who were weak and who died. In other words, lower social class, uh, minority ethnic groups, huge underreporting of cases and, and deaths still going on. And then the delayed epidemic in Africa that we've talked uh, about before. I just thought I'd put in a couple of issues here. There's a, a link to two interesting Guardian uh, articles. Uh, people are talking about, is it going to be a second wave? and there's a belief that there won't be, and others are saying a second wave is coming. It's more likely, I think, to be eruptions that will need to be stamped out. This article is by a, a veterinary epidemiologist, so it's worth a read. The other one that came out this week, yesterday, uh, was uh, Stockholm, Sweden, that had put its faith in this herd immunity approach. Uh, we had Johan Giesecke, eminent uh, epidemiologist on a, a news talk uh, at the beginning of the week, uh, saying we were doing it all wrong. Well, they have not, they are not achieving their herd immunity. Real cold water being poured on this theory. And this is our, as I transition into the theme today, why do we invest huge resources and why do we shut down our economies for weeks uh, and months? And I'm, I'm prepared with, so when, if and when I'm called upon again and asked that question, it's not just about protecting the elderly and the vulnerable. It's, it's about protecting our health workers because our health workers are not going to just let people die. Uh, and, and as we will see, there's been a huge impact in Ireland, not so much in mortality, more in incidence. The, uh, the, 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 there was a much bigger mortality in Italy and we'll be hearing from our panel about that now. But quite variable levels of, of mortality. There's a, a paper that I didn't fully cite it at the bottom, at the bottom, but our panel member will, Professor will, uh, will know about it if he wasn't uh, even an author of it. Um, but much lower levels uh, uh, incidence in Italy, and it was high levels in nurses, midwives, and 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 others. Otherwise, it was doctors. But quite high levels of deaths in Italy as well. And one of the things uh, that Italy did, which I think we did to a certain extent, was to recruit retired doctors, retired GPs, and 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 PPE shortages. That's, that's in the article there. But we by far have the highest incidence in, in Europe of infections among healthcare workers. Um, we'll see that in a minute. And I just want to uh, give a shout out to uh, uh, Michael Kelly's excellent article on gender and COVID. And, and as he points out, 75% of confirmed cases in health workers are, are among women. So uh, David Weekly prepared these slides here on uh, healthcare workers in Ireland. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really disappointed to see that having stabilised around 25-26%, uh, the latest data is suggesting it could be up around 30% of all infections. Younger, less likely to uh, be hospitalised, less likely to die uh, in Ireland. Um, uh, as we saw on the previous screen, the doctors actually are more likely to die proportionate to the numbers of their cases. And that's probably because of the aerosol procedures they do. But we're screening uh, healthcare workers better now, which is the right approach. And therefore, we are probably detecting more cases and have a lower case fatality rate. The, some of the big issues that will come out now will be around stress. Uh, and in Ireland, we may well be seeing transmission 
in the community to healthcare workers. That was one of the uh, hypotheses that came out uh, uh, four to six weeks ago, that a lot of nurses live together and, and to an extent doctors do as well. So here's just one article. I'm, I'm not going to dwell on it. We need to get onto the panel now. It's, a, it's, a, it's based on a literature review um, uh, and, and it just has identified some of the issues that we need to consider in low and middle income countries, because uh, if, if there's a priority uh, in terms of the health system is protecting the health workers. So thank you. I hope that wasn't too long, Nadine. And uh, over to uh, a much better, not more knowledgeable um, panel than I am on these issues. Rory, thank you. That was really, really useful um, and, and quite surprising, actually, I have to say, just looking at that presented the way you've presented it. Um, so I think if we can, I'll start by coming over to uh, to you, Dr. Ivanov in uh, in Geneva and just asking you, um, you know, tell us a little bit. Can, can you just maybe tell us about the WHO occupational health strategy for healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic? And we do have, if you want to look at your slides, we have some slides if you'd like us to show them or otherwise welcome just to uh, just to speak freely. Uh, no, no, uh, I, I will go to deal with our slides. Great. Uh, it is just uh, the opportunity of uh, being with you all in Zoom and uh, 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 talking, talking to you all. Um, you already know that for WHO, the, the health workers are a major concern. And we're concerned not only about the so-called healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, midwives, we're concerned about all workers, all workers in the health sector, including the cleaners, the drivers, the community health workers, the pharmacists, uh, those who do disinfection. And uh, uh, we did a lot of studies actually to understand what is driving the infections of COVID-19 among health workers. Currently, we have more than uh, 45, maybe this week already, or about 50, 50,000 uh, health workers who are already infected with, with COVID-19. Uh, the, the evidence shows that uh, there are a number of uh, occupational risk factors for the infections among health workers, which include a lot of um, uh, long contact with uh, COVID-19 patients working in, uh, in such wards, uh, of course, uh, the uh, lack of uh, sometimes insufficient personal protective equipment or insufficient compliance with the requirements for personal protective equipment. Uh, uh, a very big driver is uh, the insufficient hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is very important and has shown a lot of uh, impact on health workers. But also the studies show that uh, many health workers, actually maybe the majority of health workers, they get infected in the community. They get infected in their family, they can get infected in the community, not at the workplaces. Even some argue that the workplace is actually safer than the community when there is a widespread community transmission. So, um, also, the, the infections among health workers, those that are acquired at the workplace and that are investigated are also related to long working hours, related to poor working conditions, crowded workplaces, uh, sometimes socializing among health workers in the rest, uh, in the rest uh, places uh, uh, without really observing physical distancing uh, in such places. So, uh, workplaces and uh, workplaces in the health sector can also contribute to to the infections. But uh, in addition to that, uh, the the this whole crisis in the health sector and in the in the societies has amplified other occupational risks, quite well known occupational risks for health workers, such as violence, stigma, discrimination. We unfortunately, despite the many efforts of social mobilization around the world to applaud health workers as heroes, we see drastic cases of violence against health workers, throwing bleach in their faces, spitting in their faces, physical violence. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, health workers coming from uh, migrant health workers or from ethnic minorities, they tend to be quite uh, more targeted uh, to, to violence. Uh, we also still see uh, dramatic uh, situations of social stigma among health workers, where they have been expelled from their homes, uh, the community have beaten them, and uh, sometimes they do provoke actually that, that stigma by wearing uh, uniforms and uh, gowns going out in the community in gowns, but uh, 
it is uh, it is not uh, not tolerable. Therefore, WHO has called publicly on the 27th of uh, 28th of April. We have issued a call for zero tolerance to violence, harassment, discrimination, and stigma against health workers. And countries have already acted. India has issued a special law. China also had already a special law for violence against health workers. Unfortunately, Europe is behind in many countries. In my own country, Bulgaria, there is still not a law to criminalize violence against health workers. Uh, we are also concerned with the very high workload and already several months workload, long working hours, uh, shifts, uh, lack of uh, rest, fatigue, uh, and uh, the tremendous impact of all these crises on the mental health of health workers, where we see already cases of suicide among emergency health workers in Italy, now in the United States, and this is uh, an enormous concern. Also, there are a lot of uh, that all attention to, to, to COVID-19 has a little bit uh, downplayed the safeguards against other occupational risks. For example, back injury is, is a major occupational risk among health workers. And handling of patients, of COVID-19 patients, requires quite a lot of lifting, moving, shifting, changing positions that, that uh, are uh, also a strain for health workers. And we are concerned also about the uh, <clears throat> impact of prolonged work in PPE on health. Uh, there are uh, skin damage, there is mucus damage, there is heat stress uh, arising from long working with, with PPE. Uh, what all this crisis has shown to us is that basically we do not have sufficient level of protection of health and safety of health workers let alone their rights also, let alone their rights to refuse to work when they are not safe, let alone their rights to, to have safe and healthy working conditions, to have occupational health services. What happens in other high-risk sectors, and the health sector is among the four highest-risk sectors in the world, is that in the mines there are good occupational health services, there are special laws, there are special regulations, but when it comes to the health sector, we rely on just general occupational health and safety, and there is no special attention to the health sector. That's why uh, on the 28th of April, our Director General, Dr. Tedros, he called upon countries to develop special programs for occupational health of health workers to make sure that they have the right to decent, healthy, and safe working conditions. Over. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ivanov. That's a really, um, you've painted a really, really uh, comprehensive picture of many of the issues for healthcare workers. I wonder if you could say something just a little bit on, you know, some of the practical considerations for protection uh, of healthcare workers, particularly in low resource settings, in terms of what, what do the WHO guidelines say at the moment on that? Well, the WHO guidelines, they are for, for all kinds of countries and for all kinds of settings. We do not have specific settings, uh, specific guidance for for low income settings, we do have also some, some recommendations, uh, particularly understanding that there is a shortage of personal protective equipment and how to, to, to have a rational use of, of personal protective equipment. But uh, uh, with regards to, to all countries, and particularly those countries where the general occupational safety and health laws do not apply to the health services, this is a big concern, and in these countries, we have worked with them. Example is Kenya to develop a national program on occupational safety and health of health workers so that they enjoy also some form of, uh, some form of protection. In every health facility, there should be someone who is responsible for health and safety to make sure that there are gloves, to make sure that there are masks, to make sure that there is infectant, that workers know how to lift weights, that uh, to provide for psychological aid, to, to make sure that things happen, that is not only left to infection control, but there are also other aspects to make sure that there is triage, to make sure that they, they can wash their hands, that they have access to, to, to safe water and sanitation also, that is very important, to personal hygiene, that they do not take their clothes at home to wash them at home, and this is very important. Do not take your clothes at home. So these are very, very basic, uh, basic measures 
And of course, the most important is to apply the, the standard precautions we're dealing with our patients to prevent health workers from infections, but also the, the protection against violence. And that does not require a lot of resources. And that happens in all settings. If the violence is in the community, it will come to the health facilities as well. Dr. Ivanov, let's, um, if we can, I'm going to leave it there and ask people who are watching if they have questions for Dr. Ivanov, just to put them in the question and answers, and we'll do our best to get them to him or to answer them, um, to, to have them answered for you um, in the chat box. And if I can, I'm going to move along um, to our next speaker and then hopefully come, come circling back around. So if I can move to you, um, Dr. Ponzabi. Um, you know, we've heard quite a bit about the hierarchy of control as a risk prevention tool. Um, can you just share that with us from your expertise on occupational health? Certainly. Um, I think that when we hear about the controls um, for healthcare workers, we hear about PPE and people are very um, concentrate on the PPE and the provision of PPE uh, and the adequacy of it. But actually, PPE is only one control and there is a um, and it's only one barrier. And PPE, if, if you have the correct PPE, you have the correct training and it's used well, can, can be a good control, but all controls fail at times. And therefore it's much safer to have multiple barriers. Um, and if you have all of the other correct controls in place, the need for PPE is reduced. So the, the, the hierarchy of controls, first of all, you should try and eliminate the hazard. In the ter terms of coronavirus, that could mean um, good testing so that you can identify that those who have the virus and they can be cohorted and then you can have areas of the hospital which are virus free. And so the people working in those areas will obviously have less exposure. Um, the second level is substitution. Well, it's difficult to substitute the virus to something else. It's uh, something that we do in industry where we look to find a different uh, way of doing things. Um, and then we have engineering controls. So in hospitals, we might look at having good ventilation and we might look at physical barriers that we can put in place between the healthcare workers and the patients, screens, um, or even um, um, put the patients into, uh, into cabinets that a bit like a fume cupboard that uh, uh, healthcare workers can reach into and, and be outside and protect themselves. The next level is administration controls. And one example of that would be fitness for work. This is testing the healthcare workers to identify any who are vulnerable and removing those from the high risk settings. Um, also, um, again, testing and, and cohorting the workers may be uh, an example of that. And also very good sanitation and hygiene. And I think uh, fatigue management. And then PPE is the lowest control. Um, and that should come, uh, should come last. And as I say, if we have everything else in place, then uh, the importance of PPE is reduced and uh, people should be well protected over. Yeah. And I wonder if you could, um, you know, you're talking about the hierarchy of control. What kind of recommendations would you have for, for, for low resource settings, for instance? What, what should people be really thinking about in terms of protecting themselves? What equipment, how should they do it? Um, I think, first of all, is if they do have access to testing is to try and um, cohort patients. So try and have the, the areas where um, the, uh, the, the patients who are infected um, are treated and have a, a separate mm -hmm. area for um, non-infected virus patients for all of the other um, illnesses which are still presenting to the hospital. Um, secondly, I think... Um, look at what engineering controls you can put in place in terms of barriers, et cetera. Ventilation, we know that um, increasing ventilation can reduce the viral load. Um, so look at options for that. Um, and uh, then the administrative controls, I think, again, looking at fitness for work and identifying the most vulnerable members of healthcare staff, those who have comorbidities, those who are in the older age categories, and perhaps removing those from the areas where they have... Uh, uh, more exposure to patients. And you also need to identify the highest risk areas um, of, the of, the, of the hospital, those with aerosol generating procedures, such as the intensive care unit, um, the bronchoscopy suites, the uh, endoscopy suites. And, and it may be that um, you know, during the, this time, you have to minimize some of the procedures that are done there and they're only done for um, emergencies. And then when the procedures are done, um, the people carrying, carrying them out have the highest level of protection. 
And what about um, you know, occupational health services? Um, any recommendations or ideas on, I just see one, a question has just come in there from, um, from Sarah, just in terms of how to strengthen occupational health services, particularly in low resource areas? Um, I think that's a, a real challenge. And I, I think you know, what, what we need to do is, I think a lot of work has been um, you know, developed in, in Europe in terms of identifying you know, vulnerable um, healthcare workers, and that's something that we can share. Although um, the dif different ethnic um, mixes in different countries will will cause those to vary, I, I think that. Um, but there are there are some common themes in terms of the the comorbidities of diabetes, heart disease, um, and age as well that make people more um, susceptible. So I think uh, occupational health has a real kind of role in doing the personal risk assessments for the individual to say that they're in a more vulnerable group or not. And they can then advise the line manager and the line manager can then do a workplace risk assessment to decide if that person is fit to work in that area or needs to be redeployed um, into a different area of the hospital, which perhaps isn't patient facing. Um, I think also in some of the other, other issues that Ivan was talking around, around fatigue management, I think mental health is extremely important at the moment, uh, supporting workers, supporting managers and telling them what they need to do to provide good, good support for workers is also um, a very important role that occupational health has to, to uh, play at this part. Mm. We're also working with colleagues in other specialties such as occupational hygiene so we can get really the best information and advice about how we use PPE um, making sure that people are properly trained to use the equipment that they have, uh, that they get the fit testing that they need for the respiratory protective equipment. So even in a resource in a resource constrained environment, we need to make the best of the equipment we have, make sure it goes to the people at highest risk and that they're well trained to use it. Mm. And then just maybe as a last question, we heard a little bit from Rory about Ireland. We're going to hear a little bit more from Italy and from Kenya. But what about the UK where you're sitting at the moment? What has been the, the, the UK health workers experience during this pandemic, particularly from an occupational health point of view? Um, I, think, I think like some places, not all places, we found ourselves not very well prepared for this. Um, and there is, a, there is a theory that in the UK, we were prepared for an influenza pandemic, not a coronavirus um, pandemic, whereas I think the Asian countries perhaps were more prepared for that because of their experience with SARS. Um, I think that in the initial phases of the pandemic, we were scrabbling uh, to put in place the control mechanisms. Um, we didn't have um, enough PPE for healthcare workers. We didn't have the correct PPE and the distribution um, was uh, wasn't wasn't adequate either. I think also uh, there was a, a problem with identifying the challenges with the social care sector uh, in the United Kingdom. That these are the elderly people in in care homes, uh, not in the hospitals. Um, and the fact that we didn't have enough testing um, in the first few months or, or so of the pandemic to identify those who actually had the virus, both uh, patients and staff. And that resulted in um, people who were infected being moved into um, social, into care homes and then infecting other residents there. And that's not been um, unique to the United Kingdom. I think a, a number of European countries have uh, experienced that. I think we have had um, several hundred fatalities in healthcare workers, unfortunately, in the United Kingdom. Um, one of our experiences is that um, the Black, Asian and ethnic minority workers have been disproportionately represented in that uh, in that group and there are investigations underway as to why that has happened um, and um, you know what what can be done to to prevent that um, uh, the, the, but our experience has been as well that although there have been um, the numbers of infections within healthcare workers the majority of them are probably community acquired um, many of them I think are acquired between healthcare workers, passing one healthcare worker, infecting another healthcare worker. And although they might be very disciplined when they're actually in, in the ITU or on the ward serving the patients, they're less disciplined when they go to the breakout rooms afterwards. And uh, these may be kind of areas where infections occurred. Um, and one of the things that we've been trying to do as a society is move the debate away from just PPE to yes. actually implementation of the complete hierarchy. And that gives people more protection 
as I've said before, and uh, actually means that if for any reason their PPE isn't working, then hopefully the other barriers will uh, keep them safe and yeah. give them confidence. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. Um, I think we're going to put a link in the chat there to the hierarchy of control. And if I can, I'm going to move just from the UK over to um, to Italy to Professor Coco. Um, and obviously, Italy has been on everybody's in our hearts, in our minds, um, in terms of um, solidarity, in, in terms of how you've been uh, been coping and responding, and also just so keen to learn from the lessons of Italy. So I wonder, um, Professor Coco, if I can ask you, you know, we talked about mental health concerns that's come up a few times already on the panel. Um, what are the the mental health concerns in Italian health workers and what have they been during the pandemic and considering that the disease has shown a wise it's been a wide variation from northern to, to southern Italy have the have the healthcare um have have the issues uh, mental health issues differed among health workers in those regions I, I think that uh, actually lack of preparedness was something that uh, was common across a number of different countries all over the world and uh, uh, this was one of the problems that led to a, a series of conditions leading to different attitudes in uh, healthcare workers. For some, it was kind of uh, uh, accepting their own role and to put themselves in the front line against the disease and uh, sacrifice themselves, working long, long hours. And more or less, but the problems were more or less uh, the same that uh, uh, Dr. Ponsonby described about the UK uh, uh, situation. So at the end, uh, one of the problem in facing uh, uh, COVID was the high mortality rate, uh, particularly in the elderly, and the insufficient support from the authorities, and uh, uh, and of course the limited availability of uh, personal protective equipment, particularly in the first weeks of the, of the epidemics. Uh, so at the end, burnout was uh, really a problem for them. And, uh, 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 and this was particularly clear in the northern Italian regions uh, uh, where uh, the disease uh, eats so, so strongly. And uh, uh, on the other hand, there was another attitude uh, uh, which was based basically on fear and then the anxiety in, in dealing with the disease, which is kind of potentially deadly disease. And this problem actually was spread all over uh, the health workers, but was more clear, I would say clearer. And, uh, and, and in the, the regions where the, uh, uh, the incidence actually was lower, uh, for instance, I, I've been lucky enough to live in a uh, in, in an island <laughs> for uh, and uh, uh, to have to deal with a very limited problem compared to the rest of uh, of Italy, but fear was really uh, an issue, and uh, uh, and we had to deal with it. Anxiety and stress was particularly strong, uh, and uh, after all, uh, uh, this was the problem. One of the main problems we had to to deal with. Um, so that was the difference between uh, the low incidence versus the high incidence areas. Uh, but both problems actually were uh, occurring in, in, uh, in these all over the, the Italy or all over the country. Mm. And Professor Coco, how I mean you're talking about burnout and, and stress and how have you how have you supported healthcare workers as they have um have been dealing with burnout, with with depression or other health conditions? What have you done that we could learn from and even are, are still doing? Well, uh, uh, at the beginning, of, actually not really at the beginning, but uh, in at the beginning of March. Uh, there was an agreement between uh, uh, the Italian government, the unions, and the employer organizations, uh, uh, allowing for low for uh, people with, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say vulnerable conditions, and uh, uh, to prescribe them self isolation, and and, uh, and using a kind of uh, a special code to uh, allow them to stay in a sick leave. Uh, as a justification for their uh, uh, for the absence, and this was simply for precautionary reasons. Uh, and then uh, each occupational physician had to deal with these uh, vulnerable conditions. For instance, there were uh, instances of uh, direct or indirect 
uh, uh, immune system deficiency. Uh, and so the uh, uh, patients, uh, I mean, workers with these conditions had to be alerted and allow them to, uh, uh, to stay at home, to follow them, uh, and uh, uh, with this kind of precautionary uh, uh, sick leave, let's call it this way. And uh, then uh, for the rest of the uh, workers, they have been asked to contact the occupational physician and to, um, and to examine their cases one by one. Uh, of course, this meant a massive amount of work uh, uh, to discriminate the need uh, to balance uh, between protecting these workers and the functioning of the hospital. Uh, so, uh, on the other hand, vulnerable conditions uh, in the uh, in the agreement between the unions, the uh, employer organizations, and the, the government were uh, uh, indicated only uh, in relation to physical uh, ailments. Okay, not really uh, for instance, mental health issues were not considered, uh, and this was a problem. I mean, uh, there are not real statistics about that because uh, we would have to wait uh, uh, perhaps next year to have some numbers about that. But there were instances of suicide among uh, uh, healthcare workers, doctors and nurses. And uh, uh, I don't know, we don't know whether this really was related uh, to the stress and to the anxiety uh, and the burnout followed, uh, that followed the, the epidemics or was something that would have happened anyway, they had been described just because they happened in the wild. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, some statistics will be interesting to, uh, uh, to provide some information about that in the near future. Yeah, and I'm just wondering, um, what about the, you know, it's, it's a question I think on everybody's mind quite a lot is what are some of the Italian strategies that you've had to just to cope with the increased pressure on the health system? What lessons have you learned and particularly in relation to healthcare workers and, and support? Uh, well, first of all, uh, there were kind of economic, economical constraints in hiring healthcare workers uh, in the past. And one, uh, one of the first things that had been uh, uh, decided by the government was to uh, kind of relaxation of these uh, constraints. And so there, there have been a number of uh, 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 people that have been called back from retirement, for instance, and this has been already uh, uh, said before. And, uh, uh, and also a, a number of uh, a new hiring, a new uh, people that have been hired, uh, because to face you know the needs to uh, uh, allow uh, work healthcare workers to have uh, more reasonable uh, shifts, for instance, uh, uh, in the in, and uh, uh, some attempts are really being uh, uh, I would say uh, need to be evaluated critically. For instance, the idea of building new hospitals. Uh, I mean, uh, a new hospital has been uh, created in, in two weeks in Milan, uh, and it was planned to accept 600 COVID patients, but at the end, only 24 were admitted there, and now it's completely empty. And 2 million euros have been uh, uh, spent to create from nothing this new hospital. Uh, you know, it was a kind of attempt of replicating the Juan uh, hospital. But really, it was kind of failure because it was a decision made on the pressure of the uh, rising wave of the epidemics. Then, uh, by the end, uh, the two weeks that they employed to uh, uh, to build them, the, the the curve was decreasing. So there was not that much pressure any longer. So there was not much need of it. So this is a, a, an example of uh, lack of preparedness, really. Because uh, another, another choice instead, uh, another example, this time a good example, might come from the Cotunia Hospital in, uh, in Milan. Uh, this was a kind of uh, 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 specialized hospital for transmissible diseases. Uh, uh, and it has always maintained its role. Instead, uh, there were uh, the so-called sanatoria. I mean, the hospital to treat tuberculosis in the past <coughs> where uh, people was admitted at, at long-term admission there. 
and they were just shut down or transformed in general hospital. And at the end, general hospitals have been the place where the disease has spread more quickly uh, and more heavily. Uh, 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 and possibly a, a, a stronger net of uh, uh, support at, at the, uh, um, you know, uh, I'd say, uh, um, domestic support, I mean, on, on the territorial health would work much better than, than the hospitals to treat these diseases, because otherwise it, it might be just a, a way of, uh, of spreading it instead of curing it. Well, thank you, Professor Coco. Lots of uh, lots of food for thought there, and thank you for sharing those lessons. I think, what I, in the interest of time, I'm going to move um, move from Italy to Kenya um, to Dr. Mugambi, um, if I can. And um, Joy, you're you're at the moment you're on the front line in in Kenya, um, responding uh, responding daily at the moment to the pandemic. Tell us a little bit about the, your experience in relation to protection of healthcare workers. How, how, what's happening? Uh, thank you very much, Nadine. Um, for Kenya, I, I truly appreciate the fact that at the very beginning, our president began with putting an order for all those above 50, uh, those diabetics, hypertensives, and electives to be held um, so that we eliminate the risk for those groups. Then um, when it came to the facilities, we also limited the non-essential services and we appreciate the fact that also continuously as the numbers have been rising, we've seen regional containment of, uh, of areas where there is a high burden of uh, COVID infection. Though we, as a facility, uh, will share something that we have done when, when we started off, there was the whole challenge of uh, PPE, just as we've heard from all other regions. Uh, we didn't know where to get, flights had been stopped, most of our PPEs are imported, but we do appreciate that the industries that deal with textiles moved with speed, started production of uh, masks and uh, hazmat suits, and currently we can say in terms of PPE, the stock levels are not um, as bad as we were at the very beginning. Uh, to share out, I'll share what we currently have done as a facility. Um, as I load my PowerPoint slide, yes, I, I like the fact that we've been told the hierarchy of protection is not about what you wear. It's about um, elimination, substitution, engineering controls. And we did take that into consideration, though we did put a number of modifications. At the facility, we were wearing, we were all dressed up in our hazmat suits that uh, had been supplied in preparation for uh, eventualities of Ebola, because we are on the highway between Kenya and Uganda. And uh, remember, Ebola had struck us at one point. Um, still on the same, we moved out from wearing so much hazmat suits and built this cabin, uh, borrowing the model of uh, Korea, where it's, it's a glass cabin. Um, health workers can easily go at the back, uh, inside the, health, uh, the glass cabin, using the gloves that are extending out, take a sample or examine a patient. This is not a patient. This was just a demo to our administrative staff. Uh, and once they have done the testing, they are, it's easy for even the client to help you seal it, uh, disinfect it at the outside there, and then later come to collect the samples. We've already modified this a bit with a locker area here where samples can be easily placed. Uh, this is one of the other controls that we put in place. We uh, segregate coffers to one end and ensure that they are not mixing with the others and review them in this room at the corner there and test them out here. Any health worker can do testing. We do not have a special team that's to do testing because COVID is not going today. It will be with us for a long time. So everyone had to be trained and be able to understand how to do these procedures in an event, we also are short of staffing. Uh, the other thing we did, we've done a lot of community testing. We've also had post-mortem testing out in the community. 
this uh, is a community control measure that we were doing. We didn't want, there were travelers, there were people who had come from outside the country, but we could not leave them to travel all the way to the facilities and put others at risk in their transport systems. So we have gone into the community also doing testing. And yes, we do have the full PPE, but we are also encouraging um, the use of the cabins. And if we could get more cabins into the community, that would help. But for those we have to go into the community, we go in our full PPE. Uh, this was one case that we had that needed a uh, sample collection of one who had died in the community, and those are areas that we go through. So uh, in terms of um, PPE control, uh, PPE use, we have some, but it is not adequate, and that's why we moved on to uh, create, to uh, constructing that booth that really helps a lot in terms of even use of PPE. It minimizes um, transmission of uh, COVID and also ensures that the health worker is safe and is comfortable mentally and physically. Um, other things that we have done uh, and put in place in terms of mental health is group debriefs. Uh, because we divided our staff into three shifts. One shift comes in for a whole week since our um, workload has reduced almost to 30%. Uh, we, we come in once a week and during that reporting day on Monday, we do group debriefs with the team that's exiting and the team that's coming in. And we talk about the issues that we have encountered during the week. Uh, engage and share knowledge. And then uh, the team that's leaving for the week leaves and the new team comes in knowing what they, will, they may encounter or the challenges that they may encounter at work. Community engagement is key uh, in anything you do because if you don't engage the community, they won't change their practices and they would not accept our health workers with, uh, where I work, it's a region where, yes, uh, education is still not very um, high, at a very high level, but engaging with uh, the community has really helped because now they do understand what COVID is. They do appreciate the health workers uh, that are working with them. And since we do not have a special team for COVID and everyone is working in the COVID areas, we do not have so much of stigma that uh, the community would reject someone. We've heard of areas where stigma has happened within the country, and we are trying to encourage them to embrace the system of everyone doing the same thing so that there is no special group and there is no segregation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Joy, thank you so much for such a practical um, and also visual, um, you know, to, to give us a visual of, of, of how things are going. I think there's so many lessons uh, to be learned. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Really, really valuable. Um, I think what I'll do is just as, as we're, as, as always, kind of short on time, um, we're, we're answering as many questions as we can in the chats and in the Q&A, but maybe just to come back to each of the speakers and just to ask you, maybe I'll come back to yourself, uh, Will, if I can, um, just, just to kind of leave us with some, you know, what would be your top two um, pieces of advice or recommendations or something you want to leave us with in relation to occupational health and, and protecting healthcare workers? Uh, so my two pieces of advice would be firstly about the uh, tiered controls and I think Joy um, demonstrated that brilliantly as to you know how that's been done in Kenya um, and, and not just rely on PPE because it, it doesn't always work uh, and my second thing is to look after your people and to provide them with lots of support um, and and uh, really to reach out and it's not only the duty of managers but it's every, everyone working in healthcare to provide peer support and I heard a, a great thing from Professor Neil Greenberg which and what he said was that resilience doesn't come from the individual but resilience exists between the members of the team and it's the team working together that breeds that uh, that strength. Great, really clear. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Coco, just coming to you um, again, just leave us with two, two things that you would like us to le leave us with um, as we move on from today. 
I'll just have to unmute you. You have to unmute yourself there, Professor Coco. Yes, you're good. I'll say, yeah, uh, uh, education and uh, 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 and preparedness. These are the keys, in my view, for workers to be able to deal with such events that are not really uh, at the end unexpected. Something like that will happen again, and this time we need to be ready. And uh, all uh, workers should, all healthcare workers should be aware that they have to deal with sick people and uh, uh, and uh, they need to be prepared to do that uh, they need to be conscious uh, of that when uh, they start working in the healthcare field and uh, uh, of course they need to be able uh, and to be protected before knowing that uh, a, a patient is not uh, uh, affected by a transmissible disease not after that you know it, yeah. we say that it's like uh, you know uh, shutting the uh, uh, the barns when the uh, cows have already escaped thank you a very powerful uh, a powerful image thank you dr professor coco um, and coming back to you dr joy just give us again two two pieces of advice from kenya and you've already given us some great uh, some great wisdom what would you leave us with today thank you very much nadine uh, i would leave the health workers with this assess your risk and once you have assessed your risk stay safe and ask for help thank you very clear thank you dr joy um and and just kind of in in the theme of of continuing practicalities we wanted to um show a very short clip of um of a video that's been launched this week for health for, for preparedness in malawi in fact through a partnership between an institution here in ireland and an institution in in malawi so hala if you could um if you could take that over and show that to us thank okay. you so we are we started this uh, well, this uh, video series and it's about uh, 14 video series short animated videos and the aim is actually to help and assist health workers in low research settings to prepare for covid-19 so the topics are for example preparing your facility clinical management palliative care ppes and protecting health workers there are many partners involved in this which is gore malawi partnerships uh, and partnership is there Island, HSC Global Health, and also Irish College of General Practitioners, the Global Health Group. And they are available on Facebook page and uh, also in the website and our YouTube channel, uh, Irish Global Health Network. So now we will just uh, would play one of the videos uh, as an example. Preparing your institution for COVID-19. Hello, we can't see the video. Part one of three, yeah. COVID-19 and then the, the video, please. Target audience, healthcare managers, and senior clinic. Sorry. Of staff in low and middle income countries. The aim of this video is to help managers of healthcare institutions prepare their institution for the arrival and escalation of a COVID-19 epidemic. This short video focuses on how health facilities should prepare for the spread of COVID-19 coronavirus in Sub-Saharan Africa. It emphasizes the WHO recommendations and is based on a document by Dr. David Wickliam, Director of Ireland's Health Service Executive Global Health Program. Implementing a health service response to COVID-19 is part of a wider national, local and population-based response to control the epidemic. Population measures are of utmost importance, but are not the focus of this video. There are three priority objectives. To manage flow of COVID-19 patients, to protect the welfare of your healthcare workers, and to maintain essential health services. Your plan must be communicated clearly to all staff and patients, and backed up by visible posters and signs. Consider the physical structure of your building. You will need to provide hand washing facilities in multiple locations for staff and ideally for patients. All patients attending the hospital, even those attending for routine appointments or following injury, should enter through a single entry point. At entry, all patients should be questioned and Thank you. 
So yeah, this is an example of one of the videos. This is the first video. And until now, by the end of the day, we will have around seven videos available. So please check them and share them with all your partners that you think they will need. And uh, I guess by this, we will finish. Nadine, do you want to say anything? Okay, so thank you really for this uh, great uh, panel. And also thank you for the Society of Occupation and Medicine. It was our uh, really pleasure to co-organize this webinar with them. And thank you for the amazing speakers for all those amazing inputs. And our coming webinar will be about, um, will be about, sorry, <laughs> I forgot the name. So it will be about the broader health and health systems impact of COVID-19 in lower middle income countries. And the webinar, uh, this webinar will be available later in our YouTube channel. And uh, thank you, everyone. We are running, I guess, already late. <laughs> so thank, thank you, you everybody. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank Have you. a good weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Stay safe. <laughs>